Well, welcome back, everyone. You know, you may have been on a tour before, but you've never been on one like this, I guarantee it. Welcome to our audit report tour. Your guide for today is John Morrell. As a senior auditor on our team, John enjoys using his CPA experience to help audit clients reach their highest potential. He is a graduate of Dickinson State University with degrees in both accounting and business administration. Welcome, John. Thank you, Emily, and thank you for everyone still in attendance. Um, we've had some amazing speakers this morning, so hopefully I can do them justice and do you know just as good as they did. But you know, like Emily mentioned, uh, my name is John, and today I will be going over what at least I think is everyone's favorite literature, and that is the audit report. And so, you know, what I want to start off with before I even get into the audit report is, you know, just a quick overview of the audit process. And, you know, typically whenever we, uh, you know, engage with a client to perform an audit, the first thing we do is we have some preliminary discussions with them. Um, we also, you know, we talk with them about, you know, any issues in the past year, any concerns they may have, any financial statement fluctuations, and really just any questions that they have going into the audit. Um, you know, once we do that, we develop our audit strategy, we have our team meetings and we discuss, you know, what what areas we might look into a little more. You know, we have our risk assessment procedures, which sort of dictate that. And eventually we get into the field work stage. And over the last, you know, two and a half years or so, this has changed, you know, quite a bit just with everything COVID. Um, before COVID, every single client, except for about one that is literally in our parking lot, um, Every single audit, we would go, you know, to the client, go to, you know, sit in their conference rooms, request documents over a period of about two or three, maybe four days, and, um, you know, work on, you know, different programs such as cash and see if there's any issues anywhere, essentially. Uh, once that's done, we move into what's called the wrap up stage. And this is where, you know, whoever the in charge auditor is will be communicating with the clients. Um, if there's any, recommendations or issues that we need to bring to their attention, we will do it at that stage and we will, you know, explain it to them, get the response and anything. And eventually what we, you know, what the in charge eventually does is, is they compile what is called the draft audit report. And it's basically us saying we have come in and audited, audited you guys, and this is what we feel is an accurate de depiction of your financial situation um, and any issues that they, that may exist at your entity. And you know, we send that to the client, we ask them to look it over, let us know if they see anything um, any, that they disagree with, any mistakes, um, could be something as small as a typo or some, some sort of, of a misstatement. Um, once we get approval from the client on the draft reports, we will then um, have them sign what's called an adjustment letter, which is them agreeing to any audit adjustments as well as what is called a management representation letter, which is basically saying, you know, I provided you all this information. We take full responsibility for the financial statements and its amounts. And once we get all that, we are able to release the final audit reports. Um, but the main one that the main area I want to talk about today is that fourth bullet point there. And that is where we issue the draft report. And the reason for that is because we get quite a variety in um, the responses that we get. And they vary both in the amount of time it takes to receive the responses as well as the content of the responses. We have some clients who will read and digest the financial statements over two, three, four, five days and come back with, you know, a bullet point of, you know, five to 10 items that they say, you know, this is wrong or can you provide any more information on that? Um, and that's great. And, you know, that's really what we want because, you know, throughout those conversations, some stuff does, does get fixed. Um, and in some cases, it's just us needing to provide a little more clarification to the clients so they understand where we're coming from. But the flip side of that is we also get um, a lot of responses to the draft financials, or the draft auto report, where it's basically just, you know, looks good to me. And we get it within about 20, 30 minutes, maybe an hour. And the important thing to remember about these reports are typically they average anywhere from 45 to 55 pages. There's Definitely outliers of ones that are 20 pages and ones that are might be approaching 200 pages. Um, but the majority of them do average to be about 45 or 55 pages. So to be able to read and digest that much information is 
you know, going to take a little bit longer than, you know, 20, 30 minutes. So, you know, it really opened up my eyes to see if we can help, um, you know, really show what is really in these audit reports, because maybe in some cases the client just isn't understanding what they're even looking at. And so that's really what my goal is today, is to help you understand what is in the audit report and specifically which areas are the most important. Um, you know, to put it in simple terms, some areas just aren't, aren't as important as others. Um, how can you verify that some of the amounts are even correct? Um, when you go through, for example, your note disclosures, and I'll go through this later, but there's areas where you can look at, say, for example, capital assets notes, and you will look and you can verify that amount with on the net position, for example. And so there are areas where, you know, some late minute adjustments um, to say, for example, the capital assets note doesn't hit, doesn't get changed on the statement of net position. And so it does happen sometimes where, unfortunately, inaccurate or slightly inaccurate auto reports do get out sometimes, okay? And so I will be going over an actual auto report that we issued for a, a city in 2020. Um, this was a gap-based auto report, which means they do include receivables, payables, RSI, um, all that fun stuff. Uh, their city, so they do have business type activities, which you know for them was water, sewer, I think uh, garbage as well. And then you know this was a 2020 audit, and this is a fair sized city, about seven to eight thousand, seven or eight thousand people. Um, and so they did get a large amount of COVID funds during 2020. So it did require a single audit um, and a CFA to be to be presented, which uh, Michael you know, went over right before I got on here. So he did a great job doing that. But you know, this uh, the reason I picked this one is it does have a little bit of everything. And so I do want to say before I get into it that you know, we have a lot of variation in attendees here today, uh, ranging from some of the largest cities in the state to some of the smaller you know, water resource districts. So not everything will be up applied to everyone in this um, presentation. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Um, but the first thing, I, like, I'm, I have this broken up into two section, sections and I'll start off with the financial statements. And so the order I'll be going with is on, is on the left side. It won't agree with what you see in the image on the right side, but I will start off with the fund level statements. And that is your balance sheet and your income statement. That is pages, I wanna say six and eight on the right side. Now, if you look at where page eight is, You'll see it's a lot more wordy than just income statements. Um, it's the same thing. I always say income statements. So for purpose of, purposes of this, I'll be saying it throughout. Uh, I'll then get into the business type activities and that will be pages uh, 10, 11, and 12. That's your net position, statement of activities, and your cash flow statements. Now, and the reason I'm going in this order is because those two sets of financial statements sort of uh, roll into the government wide statements, which is the third section. There are adjustments that are made to get from fund level to government wide, which if I have time, I'll go over. Um, and then right after that, I will get into, I will get into what's called the reconciliation statements. And basically what those do is if you think of the fund balance and the net position, um, they're essentially the same thing. They have assets, liabilities, but one represents fund balance, one presents net position. So this reconciliation statement is basically just reconciling between the two and saying, why are these different? I'll then do the same thing, um, but for comparing the net income to the change in net position, because again, in essence, these are both income statements. Um, they get presented quite a bit differently, but in essence, they're the same thing. And so they basically take those same items that um, you know, will be reconciled on the fund balance and net position and accounts for the activities for those accounts. After that, I'll get into the fiduciary statements. Um, and there won't be much on there, um, typically, because really like what I'm gonna show you on the other um, financial statements, like those same rules and tips will apply to the fiduciary statements. And then I'll wrap up with some notes, um, basically just the more important note disclosures, as well as some RSI and the SI. Like I said, um, I'll be starting off with the fund level financial statements. And what you see on the left side there is the balance sheet and on the right is the income statement. And if you look at the top, um, you'll see you know funds up there. You'll see general funds, special revenue fund, debt service and capital projects. And you'll see they are presented the same on both the image on the left and the right side. 
And so just right off the bat, you know, just verify that those agree. Um, also, wherever you see something that says total, whether it's total assets, total liabilities, total revenues, just you know, verify not all of the amounts, but just verify that some of them are correct. So you know, when we prepare these financial statements, we do begin in Excel. And because of that, sometimes rows get hidden. And so say, for example, if you're verifying the total assets for the debt service fund, you'll see cash and investments of 2.8 million, um, 36,000 of tax receivable, and then 5 million of special assessments receivable. Well, say, for example, that special assessments receivable is hidden for whatever reason, and you start adding up those numbers, and you'll probably get to just over 2.9 million, and you look down at total assets and it says 8 million, you'll know right then and there that you know something is probably wrong. And so definitely verify, you know, not that all of them um, foot properly, but you know, just pick a few. Um, you can add up going up and down or left to right. Um, and then also make sure that, you know, your total liabilities and deferred inflows, which is about two thirds down that page, and your total fund balances matches up to the very total at the bottom. And that that total matches up with the total assets at the top. And another thing I would also look for is to look at the total fund balances on the left image, left image um, and verify that it matches up with fund balances December 31st on the right images. There should be absolutely no exception to that ever. So verify that those amounts match up. And then I'm gonna move over to the right image here and also verify that the fund balance is January 1st. Um, verify that those match up with your most recent audit report. So look at your prior year audit report and verify that that matches up to that report where what it said fund balance December 31st. Now, moving over to the right side, you know, this is basically presented as revenues um, minus expenditures to get to your excess of revenues over expenditures that then factors in any other financing sources and uses and to get to a net change to basically go from beginning to ending fund balance. Now, your revenues, um, those are more than what we usually see as far as revenue classifications. Um, we usually see about five, maybe six. We'll see um, taxes, licenses, fines, intergovernmental charges, and then miscellaneous are the main ones we see. Um, this city, they do have a sales tax levy, so they have that, uh, that classification, as well as a special assessment levy too. And then expenditures are broken out by what are called functions. And so a quick example, your public safety function there, those are stuff like your emergency fund expenditures, your policing expenditures, stuff like that. Um, and then in other financing sources, those are your main examples, your transfers in and transfers out. You, you'll see cap lease proceeds. Some other common ones are bond proceeds, bond premiums or discounts, um, stuff like that. Now, you'll look here and you will notice that transfers in and transfers out do not match. The only reason for that in this case is because they have, this entity has enterprise funds. And so there was uh, some transfers from enterprise um, to governmental funds. And so that's why those don't equal. Now, if you're someone who only has governmental funds, those transfers in and transfers out should always equal. Um, and I'm speaking specifically to the total governmental funds in that case. Now, moving on to the business type activity statement. Again, those same rules as far as you know, double checking some of those total um, calculations will go a long way. I will also direct your attention to some accounts that were not on the governmental funds activities, but are on this one. And that is your capital assets, your long-term debt and your compensated assets and anything related to your pension and OPEB. And that same rule will also apply to the governmental activity statement, which I'll get into right after this uh, slide here. But again, just double check those, for example, total net position at the bottom, double check that to the statement on the right. Um, also double check, you know, the beginning net position and ending net position. Um, verify, you know, you'll see that that transfers out is a negative 905,000. That should equal, if I go back one slide, to the difference between the transfers in and transfers out here, okay? So just another quick uh, area where you can verify that, you know, everything is driving correctly. Another important distinction you'll see on the, um, in this case, net position, but it's basically a balance sheet, is that the assets and the liabilities are broken up by current and non-current. Now, current is basically anything within one year, non-current anything after. 
And on the right image, which is your statement of activities for enterprise funds, you'll see it doesn't just say revenues, expenses, and other financing sources. It says operating revenues, operating expenses, and non-operating. And so it's an important distinction for these statements that you have to present it that way. And basically, your operating revenues or operating expenses are basically exactly how it sounds. It's anything to that is necessary to operate, in this case, your water system, your sewer system. I'm pr pretty sure in that other enterprise funds is just a, a, a garbage operating fund. And then, so your non-operating revenues and expenses are, you know, just the exact opposite. Your interest income is any interest you earn on any sort of savings accounts. Your interest expense is any uh, interest that you paid along with your uh, principal payments for your debt. And same with your service charges and administration fees, that's also associated with your debt payments. Now, moving on to the um, cash flow statement, I won't get into this one as much because we simply because a lot of our clients don't have to present this, but you know, a couple quick spots to look at. Again, if you look about two thirds down the page, you'll see cash and cash equivalents for January 1st and December 31st. Verify, you know, both those to both last year's reports as well as you know the slide before um, for your December 31st, and make sure that it matches up with your cash line item. Now, your cash flows from operating activities, um, your receipts from customers and uses, those are basically your charges for services on the previous slide, but it factors in any changes in receivables. Same thing to payments to suppliers, that's you know, payments for purposes of operating your you know, water or sewer system, but factoring in any changes to pay accounts payable. Okay, And so that's really the main areas. A lot of those other ones should just match up um, with the slide from before. And these two sets of statements really just roll into the government wide financial statements. And so if you look at the statement of net position on the left side, you'll see governmental activities, you'll see business type activities. The business type activities specifically, those amounts should just come directly from the total column on the business type net position. Same thing on the right side, you'll see about two, two th or actually about just under halfway down on the left side, it's a bolded heading for business type activities. And that's where it's breaking out all your expenses by which um, specific business type fund it was. And so the, where it says fees, fines, and charges for services, those should simply match up with the operating revenues on the um, statement of activities. And then same thing for the expenses down below, in the general revenues for business type activities, those are basically your um, your trans like the net of the two transfer transfers between business type and general or governmental funds, as well as any investment earnings as you see there. And so again, verify those beginning net position numbers on the right. It's pretty far down there where it says net position January one, and also just verify that that net position December thirty first matches up on the left side. Um, for your statement of net position there. And then same sort of rules apply for the governmental activities. If, if for any of those accounts that were on the balance sheet, those same totals should come over. The only difference, and this is the same thing as how it was with the business type activities, is that the government wide presents your capital assets, debt, compensated absences, anything related to your pension and OPEP. Okay. And so from when we do the fund level statements, there are adjustments that we make to bring on um, the capital asset amounts, your debt amounts. And typically, you know, it involves what we call a Gatsby crosswalk where we're just um, factoring in the activity for any capital assets or debt or any of those funds that I mentioned. Now, the next set of statements is what I like to, or not what I, is your reconciliation statements. And again, the one on the left is going from your total fund balances to your total net position. So first thing I would look at is your total fund balances at the top there. Verify that that matches up with your balance sheet, the total fund balances on your balance sheet. Also look at your total net position, governmental activities down below. Verify that that matches up with the slide before where you have your total net position. Now I should mention these are only for your uh, governmental funds. These do not um, matter for your business type activities at all. But also verify that, you know, in between those two amounts that all those amounts are correct. For example, you can look at the capital assets and see that 47 million. 
that should match up to your net position. And then again, just verify that the calculation going from top to bottom does um, calculate properly. Because again, this is another situation where there could be some cells hidden um, and we don't want, you know, we don't want to have an inaccurate statement here. Now, the statement on the right is the same idea, except it's going from your um, income statement to your statement of activities instead of your balance sheet to your net position. So it starts off with your net change and fund balances, which will come from your, from your income statement and reconciles down to your change in net position of governmental activities. And you'll see like those, everything in between there, like I mentioned, is basically the activity that are associated with all the fun, all, all the accounts that are listed on the right. So on the left statement, you see 47 million. Well, on the right, you'll see capital outlay, you'll see capital contributions, and you'll see depreciation expense. And so that's basically accounting for the activity in that account for the year. And so that's why we have to present these in order to reconcile from your net change in fund balance to your change in net position. Then as far as the notes, you know, there's definitely ones that are more um, important than others or more interesting than others, I should say. But the first one, note one, is always your significant accounting policies. This is where you talk about your measurement focus, um, basis of accounting. It'll get into your useful lives for capital assets, um, how you account for long-term debt or pension and OPEB, um, how you classify your net position and your fund balances as well. Um, note two, typically if there are prior period adjustments, that's where that one will go. And that's, you know, the most common one is for any capital asset adjustments that we, you know, we had to restate the financial statements. Um, so that's where those go. The next most common one is your deposits and investments notes. The mo more common of those two is your deposits note. And that's where we get into um, uh, state pledging laws and where we determine whether or not you're in compliance with state pledging laws. If you do have investments with like a brokerage firm or anything like that, um, there are required disclosures for that. That's, to be honest, that's probably typically about five to 10 of our clients every year has that investment. So there's not very many. Um, pension and OPEB notes are another very common one um, that typically comprises probably about, you know, six, seven, eight pages of the note section itself, just in those two notes. Um, and then another common one is any commitments for construction or any other type of commitments as well. And so that's another required disclosure to, you know, where we have to look into it, make sure it's accurate. So that's another common one. Uh, risk management note, that's basically you saying that, you know, you have all this equipment, um, buildings, but that it, it's also insured and that you also, it'll mention uh, workforce safety insurance as well. Um, basically it mentions any sort of uh, insurance coverage you have. Contingent liabilities, these are basically, if you have any sort of material lawsuits um, that may or may not have an unfavorable outcome, we have to disclose those in the notes section as well. And then subsequent events are typically reserved for um, debt issuances. So say, for example, we are auditing December 31st of 2021, and we're performing that audit right now in at the end of August. Um, if you issued a debt, a bond, for example, in May of 2022, so that's kind of in between there, we would have to list that as a subsequent event and basically say that clients issue debts, um, these are the payments, this is how long it's outstanding for, and so that's what that note is reserved for. And one of the more important notes that I wanted to go over is the capital assets note, and I alluded to this earlier, but on the left side is your statement of net position and on the right side is your capital asset note, which has basically a table showing the activity during the year for um, all capital asset classifications. So in this case, they have buildings, equipment, vehicles, infrastructure, um, land, CIP and intangible. And so it's basically saying, you know, these are your restated balances. In this case, it only says restated balance because there was a PPA for capital asset. Um, we could, if a client wanted to, we could put the balance that was at the on the last year's audit report and have a column for PPA and do a restated balance that way if we wanted to, or if the client wanted us to, but typically this is how we present it. Um, and then it basically just goes from your restated balance to your ending balance and factors in any increases as far as any capital asset additions, any decreases as far as what you may have sold during the year or maybe 
you know, trade it in or you determine that it's obsolete and you don't use it anymore. It also has transfers and that's typically when you are done with a construction in progress uh, project and you have to transfer it out to a different classification and, and actually start depreciation. That is what that column is for. Now, if you go about two thirds down that table, you'll see where it says less accumulated depreciation. Um, that is factoring in your increases and decreases to depreciation for the year. So your increases are simply, um, you know, what type of depreciation did each asset class have during the year? The decreases are the total accumulated depreci depreciation from any assets that you um, disposed of during the year. And so what I would typically look for with this capital asset note, if you look at the very bottom right of the table, um, you see 47, that are 47 million 800,000 and change. And then, you know, just verify it to your statement of net position and you'll see that it matches up perfectly. Also in the table below, this is us stating where the depreciation expense was charged to, like which functions and programs. And so you may remember, you know, income statement has their function, functional expenses, and so does the statement of activities. But in order to get from the income statement amount to the uh, statement of activities amount, we have to adjust for any depreciation expense um, amongst other things. But here, what I would look for where it says total depreciation expense of 1,916,000 and change, and just look um, up just a little bit to that total accumulated depreciation column, the second number over and it matches up. So another area to look for. And the next um, note disclosure that has a good amount of importance is your long-term liabilities note. And this one's a little more detailed because it does include that due within one year in the right column. But, you know, first look at that balance January 1st um, column and verify it again to your last year's audit report. Also look at the balance December 31st. Um, and for example, the special assessment bonds in that column is 10,433,000. Verify that that matches up to your statement of net positions. And, you know, if you look due within one year is on the statement of net position is 1.2 million um, and change. And then outside one year is 9.7 million. If you add those up, those should match up um, to the total in the balance December 31st column. Same thing for the lease is payable, same thing for compensated absence is payable. Also verify that, you know, you see the amortization schedule at the bottom. And, you know, this is where it does pay to verify because it, if you look at those special assessment bonds at the very bottom, the principal total is 10,433,446. And if you look up again at that special assessments row, it's only 10,433,168. So there's about a $300 difference there. Now, off the top of my head, I do not know the reason for this. There's probably some late adjustment in the audit process that didn't hit um, both uh, tables there. So, you know, that's just another area that you can verify that these amounts are correct. Also look at the due within one year on the top image there and verify that it matches up with what's coming due um, in the first year of the amortization schedule. And so in this case, you can see that it matches up for both special assessment bonds and capital leases. And then the next part, this is, you know, immediately following the actual notes to the financial statements. This is called required supplementary information. And the most common ones are basically what you see here. And the first one on the left side is the budgetary comparison schedule for the general fund. This client also would have had this same statement, but for the special revenue fund. Um, and, you know, with this, I would basically look at the actual column. Just verify that those match up with your income statements for each fund that's presented. Also just match up with your original budget or look at the original budget and final budget um, amounts and verify that they match up with your records. Okay. Because basically those two columns are basically taking the, you know, original budget that you would have prepared. And then if you had any budget amendments during the year, it's showing that information here. And just looking at the numbers, I think the only amendment they had would have been to that transfer out uh, category there. The On the right side, these are um, what are essentially required to be reported as RSI um, through your PERS and OPEP schedules. And I'm not going to get too much into this part. Um, basically, these numbers come directly from um, the reports that North Dakota PERS um, sends out every year. 
typically in January, February. Um, and so if you're ever wondering where these numbers come from, you know, ask us. You can also go to the NDPERS website. You should be able to find it there. Um, but if you're not able to, please ask us or if it if you're audited by someone else, and you have a good relationship with them, you can ask them too and they should be able to help you. And then this is the notes, the required supplementary information. Now on the left image is basically talking about, you know, it said stewardship, compliance and accountability. It's basically talking about the budgeting process for the year. Now this will look different, whether you're a city or a county or a school, but it's basically just um, referencing all the applicable North Dakota Century Code budgeting laws. And so it is some good information if you ever wanna read it. Um, but that's what that is. And then on the right side, the first table, uh, note two is your uh, budget amendments. And so what I would typically look for here, if you look at your original budget column and your amended budget column, um, those should match up for the general fund at least to the image on the left here. And so yeah, and you also have to remember for this table, it's expenditures and transfers out. So if you add up total original budget and final budget, um, expenditures and transfers out, it should reconcile to the table that is on the right page here. And then right in between is just any budget amendments during the year. And so again, with this uh, special revenue fund and special revenue fund would have been presented as a uh, budgetary comparison schedule. So you can easily verify to those. The other two, I would just verify to your, uh, your own records. And then immediately following that, uh, note three, note four, note five, these are also required note disclosures that are associated with your pension and OPEP plans. So, and when NDPERS um, issues these reports each year, they also issue a disclosure template. And so these, this verbiage comes just directly from that. And so again, you can always look at that website and make sure that they match. If you want you know, us to point you in the direct, right direction and send you a link, we can always do that as well. And moving on, this is the supplementary information. And so uh, Michael would have presented this very well right before this, but this is basically the CIFA for this client. And again, just you know, verify that some of the amounts are correct. Um, you know, look at you know, verify that like the the correct pass-throughs are correct, the correct um, ALN numbers. Um, Michael talked about how it's changed from CFDA to ALN very recently. You know, I'm not entirely positive on what the change date was, but this one might actually, there's a chance it should have been ALN number as well. And so that's just another area where, um, you know, we may have had a little typo there. Um, but again, just double check that all the information is correct. And then on the right side is the notes to the CIFA. And it basically just talks again about your basis of accounting, um, accounting policies related to your, um, your, your federal expenditures, pass your grant numbers. For that one, it basically just states that for any of that say NA that the client was unable to get the pass through grant for number. And then your indirect cost rate, this is just a required disclosure uh, for the 10% de minimis rule. And then, so that sort of wraps up the, um, the financial statement portion of this. The next area that I'm gonna talk about is basically the blue highlighted sections on the right. And that is the reports that you know, we as an auditor's office prepare to supplement your financial statements. And the easiest way I can explain it is it's basically anything that Josh Gallion signs at the bottom. And so the first one I'm gonna get into has had quite a lot of changes um, recently, and that is the independent auditor's report. And so the what's basically derived these changes is, is what's called AUC 700. And this was effective for any uh, audit periods ending on or after December 15th of 2021. And so that, you know, in layman's terms, that's basically saying any audit period, December 31st and after. And so with this, just verify that, you know, you can look at this report and verify that either in 2020 or 2021, it's basically like the format looks different than you're, what you're used to essentially. And so I should also mention that, you know, it's for sure effective for December 31st, 2021 audit periods. Your auditors could have early implemented this for one year prior. So some, some of the clients out there may have their December 31st, 2020 audit or June 30th, 2021 audits already have this change implemented. 
And so basically what this did is it changed the order of the content um, that is presented here and also expanded the auditor's responsibility section. And right off the bat, you'll see the opinion is mentioned right away. And that is a change from before where depending on how long this report was, your opinion was usually at the bottom of the first page or the top of the second page. In this case, they wanted to present it right away. And so that's why you see that, you know, in the very first section there. And I wanna draw special attention to the very first line where it says, we have audited the financial statements of the governmental activities, business type activities, uh, each major fund and the aggregate remaining fund information. And these are what are called your opinion units. And to go through each one individually, your governmental activities are basically your um, net position and statement of activities. Business type activities are your enterprise funds. Um, each major fund, if you remember back to the fund level statements, there were four major funds listed at the top. And so that's where your each major funds are, as well as any major funds on your business type activities. And the last one there is the aggregate remaining fund information. And so those consist of your fiduciary statements, as well as any uh, non-major funds. And those typically get wrapped up into one opinion unit that is called aggregate remaining fund information. And the reason why I say that, you know, it's important to look at that is anywhere in any of these reports that I'm going to show you from here on out, if it says one of those um, opinion units, it should say all of them immediately following. And so even if you just go to the very next paragraph, um, the second line where it says financial position of the governmental activities, business type activities, each major fund and aggregate remaining fund information, you know, just verify that anywhere in any of these reports that any of those are mentioned, um, that all of them are mentioned. Because if not, um, there's probably an issue there. The next section is your basis for opinion. Now before, the only time that we really had to put basis for opinion was if there's a modification to the report. For example, if you had a disclaimer of opinion for a scope limitation, it would say basis for disclaimer of opinion. And then in the paragraph, we would state why we're giving a disclaimer of opinion. Now with this AUC 700, um, that basis for opinion will always be there. The next section is your emphasis of matter. This is typically reserved for um, PPAs. Um, and in this case, it's basically just stating that there was a restatement to the financial statements and that our opinion is not modified with respect to this. The other common one is if there's any sort of new accounting standards that you're um, implementing, or if you are changing your basis of accounting, say for example, from modified cash audit to a cash or to a gap audit. The following section, uh, responsibilities of management. This is you know, exactly how it sounds. It's just stating what uh, you as a client are responsible for. And it's basically saying that you're responsible for fair presentation of the financial statements. And then, you know, an important, another important distinction is that, you know, before this change to AUC 700, it was typically a two page um, independent auditor's report. Now it's probably pretty rare that it's gonna be two page. It's probably gonna be three pages in most cases. And so you'll see right off the bat that it you know goes pretty far down on that third page. But you know, I mentioned before there was a change um, with this where it really expanded the auditor's responsibility section. And so again, much like the management's responsibility, this section is just stating what our responsibilities are as auditors. And you will notice the bullet point listing um, in the second paragraph. That was not in the independent auditor's report before. And so that's just another thing they added in. And typically before this was, I want to say it was two paragraphs, so it was quite a bit shorter, but now it's definitely expanded quite a bit. Uh, the next section is talking about your required supplementary information. And I want to draw attention to, you know, towards the end of the first line there where it says require that the budgetary comparison schedules, schedule employer share, and it says a bunch of other stuff there. Verify that all those italicized words, I'm going to go back two slides here. Verify that those match up with what's listed as required supplementary information because it should always match up. Um, and again, same thing with your supplementary information. It'll mention um, you know, what's listed as supplementary information. Verify that that matches up as well. Um, and then that's really like the most important areas of this section. 
Now, the next report is what's called Report on Internal Control over Financial Reporting. And again, I think it's the third page, about four words in, where it says, you know, we have audited the financial statements of the, and it lists those same four opinion units. So again, look at those, verify that those match up. Uh, the next section under internal control or financial reporting is basically describing what is a material weakness, uh, what's a significant efficiency. And at the very bottom of the page, it'll say what uh, recommendations there were and whether or not they were a material weakness or a significant efficiency. In this case, they only had one recommendation, which was a material weakness. And you'll see on the very last line, it references the recommendation number, which you will see in a little bit. And it says that it was a material weakness. Now, if they did have a significant deficiency in addition to the material weakness, this would be formatted quite a bit differently. Um, so just you know, be aware of that. And then you know, going over to the right side, you'll see compliance and other matters. If there were any recommendations that related to uh, compliance issues, whether it's you know improper bidding of equipment or not having adequate pledge pledges of your deposits, um, those would show up as recommendations here, and it would again list the recommendation number in there as well. And so again, if there were was any for this audit, you know it'd be a good idea to verify that those matches up to uh, future slides that I have up here. Um, in this case, I can say pretty happily that they only had the one recommendation. So this report was pretty cut and dry. Um, the another one, the next one is client responsive findings. That's basically just us saying that as part of you know issuing recommendations, we did have to get response responses to those recommendations, and that we in no way audit those finan or audit those uh, responses. And so moving on to the next report. Um, that is the report on compliance for each major federal program. Now, if you are someone who did not require a single audit or have to present to CIFA, this information would not be a part of your audit report. And you know, the easiest way I can explain this report is that this is basically the same as the last report, but it you know mentions you know that um, we're doing this because there is a single audit. Um, we're issuing an opinion on each major federal program. If there were any compliance issues that were specific to the federal single audit, they would show up here as opposed to in the previous report. And so, um, like I said, you know, if you never had a single audit, if you never had to represent to CIFA, you would have no idea what this report is. Um, but I would also, you know, tell you to be cautious about that because, you know, with ARPA and COVID and everything, it's just showing us that everything's unpredictable. So, you know, even the smallest entities could at some point have to have a single audit for, you know, who knows what reason. But again, it shows management's responsibility, it shows auditor's responsibility, which again, same thing, it's just you know exactly how that sounds, where just listing out who is responsible for what. Um, in the case of the management, it's basically just saying that they are responsible for compliance with any federal regulations that are you know, associated with the major federal programs. Next section is the summary of auditor's results and findings. Now, the image on the left is where we sort of compile the results of the audit. And so the first thing you'll see is types of reports issued, and there's those same four opinion units. And you know, just another area to double check that those match up. In this case, um, you know, all four opinion units had an unmodified opinion, which is great. Um, there are times where you could have one or more of them be you know, modified in any way, but then others be unmodified. So that's why it's important to distinguish between the different opinion units. And then the very next section, um, internal control or financial reporting, it lists the three types of recommendations that you can get as part of your um, internal control over financial reporting reports. So material weaknesses, significant efficiencies, and non-compliance. So verify that this matches up with the um, internal control over financial reporting reports. In that case, the only uh, recommendation they had was a material weakness. So that's the only one here that is checked yes. Now, again, if you did not have a federal single audit, this report would stop at that point. You would not see where it says federal awards and below, you would never see that. Um, but if you do, uh, the federal awards is basically you know the same as up above, but applying it to the uh, federal single audit mentions if there's any material weaknesses or major programs, any non-compliance, um, whatever the opinion was, in this case is unmodified, 
Further down below, it does identify the major program. In this case, the Coronavirus Relief Fund um, mentions the dollar threshold, which uh, Michael talked about you know, earlier today, as well as whether they qualified for low risk audit, which basically consists of, you know, the main one is you have to have a federal single audit the prior two years. And so if you're someone who didn't have to have present to CIFA uh, the previous audits, uh, you would not be able to be a low risk oddity. And that was the case here where the their 2019 report, they did not have to present to CIFA, so there's no single audit. So they could not be a low risk oddity, which is why it says no there. On the very following page, you'll see the schedule of audit findings and question costs. Um, I'm not gonna go too much over the specifics here, but I do wanna talk about the components of a recommendation. And so the first one you'll see there is the condition. And this is basically just us saying what happened, okay? In this case, um, they had an item that they had uh, included in construction and progress over a course of three or four years. Eventually, we found out that all along it should have been expensed instead of capitalized. So we had to issue a PPA and, an, and a recommendation for that. Uh, the effect is basically saying because, the, because of the condition, what else could happen? Um, in this case, we're saying that you know, it could increase the risk of material misstatements and financial statements. The cause is, you know, really probably the most important part of this recommendation because it's really our best effort to get to what is the root cause and what really causes to happen. And so in this case, it, we determined that it's because, you know, there wasn't someone other than the preparer reviewed the capital asset listing before they sent it in for the audit. Uh, the criteria is basically just saying, um, you know, why are we even able to give this recommendation? And so in this case, we reference GAAP. Um, and so it basically says that, you know, GAAP requires financial statements to be presented free of material misstatements. Um, repeat finding, in this case, it was a yes. Um, the recommendation is basically just us, you know, attempting to help you fix it and, you know, recommending something that we think will fix the issue. And you will notice it a lot of the same words in the recommendation also show up in the cause. Um, so in the cause, we said they have don't have someone other than the preparer review the, the listing. In the recommendation, that's exactly what we're recommending is that they have someone other than the preparer review the capital asset schedules. And then client response, if there wasn't a single audit here, the response would just be listed right there. But in this case, they do. And with single audits, if there are recommendations, you are required to have a corrective action plan. And so that's the image that you see on the left. And so the condition is just coming directly from the slide before. And then the corrective action plan is just them stating, we agree or we disagree and why, or we agree and this is what we're gonna to do to fix it. The last section is just, when do you think you'll be able to fix it? If you go over to the uh, right image, this is basically looking at the, um, the uh, findings from the prior audit and giving a, a status update on it. And so we asked the client to give us you know, an update on how they did it. And depending on what the response is, we will, we might you know, tailor some uh, audit procedures for that to verify that they did it correctly. And then you know, determine whether the recommendation needs to be reissued. Then the last report is the governance communication. Um, again, the very first line of that top paragraph, those same four opinion units. Um, it gets into our responsibilities again. Um, it gets into some significant accounting policies. It typically talks about uh, capital asset lives is the main one. Um, going over, you'll see corrected and uncorrected misstatements. Um, in this case, all misstatements were corrected. If there were any uh, past adjustments for something that wasn't material, those would show up here as an uncorrected misstatement and it would say why. Um, disagreements with management, I can happily say that we've never had to put any disagreements with management. Um, management representations, that's just us saying that we agreed a representation letter before we released the audits. Um, management con consultation, that's not as important. Um, difficulties encountered in performing the audit. Again, I can happily say, you know, in my seven and a half years here, we've only had to put something there once. Um, and then, you know, other audit findings, findings or issues. This is basically just talking about, you know, um, you know, we discuss a variety of matters, and then you know mentions that it's you know the information is, is intended 
you know, specifically only for, you know, some users, not for everyone, okay? Um, and yeah, that's the end of my presentation. I know there may have been some questions come in throughout. Yeah, thanks so much, John. So appreciate it. Uh, we did receive a number of questions, but some of them also relate to the committee as a whole for that Q&A session. So we're just going to head and um, take a brief pause here, and then we will be starting again right at 2.30 with the Q&A session. Okay. Thanks so much. Appreciate it.